Good afternoon. It is such a pleasure to welcome you to McDowell. Um, as you know, this place is a place and an idea. Uh, first, it was a farm, Hillcrest. David Macy still lives on it, as do all the other fellows. Uh, then there was the idea, the Peterborough idea, studios providing uh, seven disciplines for, uh, to compose, write, and solitude, community. Uh, but neither the idea nor the place works without the other. Metal Day joins the place and the idea. You came here to this place to celebrate the idea and this year we honor Sonia Chan Sanchez, who exemplifies the idea and in our presence, the place. Um, there'll be much more to be said about Sonia and the arts today as our program continues. First of all, you'll hear from our dear chair, chair Nell, I as long as she remains here. <laughs> <laughs> Then our passionate executive director, Philip Himberg. About Philip, I'd just like to say a word. Uh, we thought it would take him five years to uh, begin the necessary renovations to the idea. It has taken him only three and a half. <clears throat> Thank you. <clears throat> Introducing the medalist will be the former fellow, 2001, Mr. Walt Mosley. Last night, uh, when I asked him uh, about his first meeting, Sonia, if he, asked, if he recognized any similarities in their language, all he said was that he wished he could write like her. <laughs> then we will listen to the beautiful voice of Sonia Sanchez. After that, our supremely confident and slightly droll resident director <laughs> has the unenviable task of following Sonia and then he will adjourn us, David, to go forth, picnic, and visit the soul of our place, the studios. So a word about McDowell. We continuously, re continuously restore this place by repairing the studios and tending the grounds. Sometimes we have to take the studios down to the studs, find out what is there, and rebuild them using the best materials and technology available. What is also true is sometimes we have to take the idea down to the studs and rebuild it. Uh, at this, we've been laboring since 2019 as Cheryl, Cheryl Young retired and Philip joined us. Hence, the word colony is gone. We, the board and the staff, interrogated and restated our values and how we govern ourselves. We began before the social justice surge following George Floyd's murder and continued through the pandemic. Diversity, equity, inclusivity, and access are the primary building materials in the renovation. It is, however, not complete. We realize the Peterborough idea only to the degree we keep striving for it. Board members, Amy Davidson Sorkin and Lewis Hyde did the heavy lifting on our value statement. Our governance from board size to committee structure to the bylaws was examined by Christine Fisher, Bill Beekman, David Baum, and Rick Stone, who wrestled for more than two years with it. The board members on the Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Access Task Force were Ann Stark Locker, Carlos Morea, and Josh Siegel. Their work now touches everything that happens at McDowell. Daryl Harvey and Rosemary Fiore labored on the inaugural work of the Compensation Committee. Our staff, coordinated by Jenny Wu, worked side by side with the entire board. As part of this, we have three new board members, Jeannie Soup Gerson, who's here. Jeannie, just wave your hand. Oh, thank you. I can't see, I have my glasses off. <laughs> um, Let's see, Jeannie, uh, Katie Firth, and Julius Tapper. Please read about them on our website. They reflect who we are. I especially invite you to a studio 
taken down uh, to the studs in 2022. This former hay barn was named the Firth Studio in 1992 after Valley Dreyfus Firth, Katie's grandmother. The project architect will be there to tell you how that renovation was done. But now Nell will tell you how we are doing. Thank you. Hello, everyone. First, I'd like to give the land acknowledgement. McDowell's staff and board acknowledges that our residency program takes place in Wabanaki, the Dawn land, on the traditional unceded homelands of the Abenaki people and the Begontacook River. We also acknowledge that our New York office is located on Lenape land. We lament the devastation of centuries of warfare and colonialism and join voices within our field of artistic communities calling for a necessary illumination of the history and of investment in the future of the indigenous peoples of North America. We acknowledge the continued presence and sovereignty of indigenous communities and nations today and thank our indigenous colleagues and fellows for their goodwill in our ongoing efforts to collaborate in the challenges of decolonizing the arts. McDowell has begun our own work with efforts to understand the history of the indigenous people of our region. Through outreach to local and national indigenous communities and by evaluating and adjusting our residency programming to be safe and welcoming to all indigenous artists. Art is a powerful, yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Art is a powerful tool for imagination, reckoning, and change. And McDowell is committed to offering a place for such art to be made. Fellows should be aware of the existence of Native artists here and Native peoples. Thank you to our McDowell staff and guests, and welcome to all of you to the awarding of the 62nd Edward McDowell Medal to the internationally renowned poet, Sonia Sanchez. <laughs> A year ago in Peterborough, we gathered cautiously, limitedly, to recognize the composer, songwriter, and musician, Roseanne Cash. Were any of you here then? Just a few. Yeah, we were squished up. We, no, we were stretched out. <laughs> we still had then, and still have now, COVID-19 on our minds. Though gratefully, we return to our regular programming to recognize with enormous pleasure the eloquent engaged and heartfelt poet Sonia Sanchez, this woman with razor blades between her teeth. <laughs> At any point in the last 50 years, I would have felt honored to open a program starring Sonia Sanchez, an inventor of new ways of writing, speaking, and singing poetry, for she has been speaking her truth, a truth rooted in black identity, self-awareness, and self-esteem. But at this moment in the summer of 2022, Sonia Sanchez speaks to all Americans in this frightening moment whose politics slam us back into the mid 20th century, into the years when the meanness of American apartheid penalized all of us who were not white not male, not straight. Speaking to black audiences early on and publishing in black and non-mainstream publishing houses, 
Sonia Sanchez taught us to speak truth to power and to love ourselves. She walks on freedom's legs and bids us follow in her path. Sonia Sanchez has blazed her path for more than 50 years, a shining example of the 20th century artists I ask you to remember last year. Let me remind us all today in 2022 that Sonia Sanchez has much to teach us about life in hard times, about keeping in mind and fostering the better parts of American society. Now in the times when once again, our country can frighten us with its meanness. We have been in places like this before. And Sonia Sanchez, the real thing, who has remained true to her gifts, lights the way out and tells us how to grow our own freedom legs. Good afternoon. Uh, for our guests who regularly celebrate with us this day, how does it feel to be back at McDowell in person? Yes, for all of us. And uh, welcome everyone to this splendid occasion when at long last we are assembled in real space and time the way human beings are meant to be together, side by side and in celebration. I actually see today as a kind of jubilee as we emerge into this daylight to remind us all of art's power to transform the world. We are here to offer our esteem and gratitude to an artist among us, Sonia Sanchez. Ms. Sanchez is a singular voice, yet a voice profoundly woven into the tapestry of our country, our world. With power and grace in her words and actions, Ms. Sanchez imprints her vision, her advocacy, her exquisite language into the creative landscape of humankind, and we are the beneficiaries of that inspiration. Sonia, we are here to rejoice in the influence of your art, which arouses in us how we imagine being our most human selves. And of course, this vision will move forward to inform and enlighten and inspire endless new generations of poets and art lovers. This is what the Edward McDowell Medal is all about. Sonia, we are here to thank you for sharing with us the art of your words. I met many of you for the first time right here in 2019, our last fully public medal day, and my first year as executive director of McDowell when we honored artist Charles Gaines. As we joined together three years back, we had not a clue what would be arriving down the pike only seven months later. The expectations of our universe have turned quite upside down, the pandemic, and a social justice movement that ignited us powerfully after the tragic murder of George Floyd, all of this and more continues to touch every single one of us. But these changes did more than touch McDowell. World events catalyzed us and transformed us and continue to do so in crucial ways. If you visit our updated, updated website, you will find provocative and inspiring essays by McDowell Fellows about how they see McDowell's vitality at this time. And you can also read a revived and vibrant expression of our community's core values. In March 2020, our campus was closed for about seven months. It was the first closure since 1938 when a hurricane swept through Peterborough. And then under the guidance of resident director, David Macy, with the support and professional advice of a McDowell fellow who was also an epidemiologist and a writer, we were able to swing open the gates with safety measures in place. We are proud to say that we have hosted 314 artists and residents since October 2020 through today. And 
These include 139 writers, 40 visual artists, 35 theater artists, 23 interdisciplinary artists, 33 filmmakers, 28 composers, and 16 architects. And today we are just about at full capacity. There is no way this would be possible without the most extraordinary staff, while our McDowell, New York-based personnel continued and continues to find ways to support and fund fellowships during a time of great challenge and to create new online ways for McDowell supporters to convene with our fellows, the McDowell New Hampshire staff pivoted endlessly to assure that each and every artist truly found their temporary home here in Peterborough, a place where they could engage with this natural beauty and with their imaginations, a place they could take risks, make mistakes, invent and forge new work. It has not been an easy chapter. And so may we take a moment to applaud the entire staff of McDowell for their always vigilant, always smart, endlessly flexible, sensitive and celebratory dedication to artists and the freedom to create. And today we are here also because of the extraordinary work of our board of directors. Under the leadership of President Andy Senchak and Madam Chairman Nell Painter, our board collaborates to assure the sustainability of McDowell far into the future. Today would not be possible either without the Medal Day Selection Committee led by fellow Claudia Rankin, board member of Ajay Sashadri, Erica Hunt, Nuara Asaldir, Jericho Brown, and David St. John. Also, thanks to our Middle Day Host Committee and event partners who are listed in your programs, which include business sponsors and community partners, SVB Private, the Poetry Foundation, Welch and Forbes, River Mead, the Peterborough Town Library, Beacon Press, Delta Dental, Mellison, Milliard Bank, BCM Environmental Land and Law, the Putnam Family Foundation, and so many others. And we are here because of all of you our friends, our neighbors, supporters, our donors, you who champion McDowell. And it is our artist fellows who also define us by how they invent and innovate. And since we last met on these grounds, the institution of McDowell has also <coughs> invented and innovated. We have created virtual McDowell, month-long online conclaves of our artist fellows representing the vast landscape of how art is made across a far-reaching universe of artist communities. So far, six virtual McDowells have helped us plan our future, and there are more iterations to come. Today, we all stand with you, proud of McDowell and its resilience. We remain a cultural institution whose mission is steadfast, acknowledging that we are always a work in process, and that we will always uphold our being curious to the vital questions before us. Questions like, how do we assure that we are an arts organization prepared for an elusive future and that we are not institutionally removed from the stunning, in fact, breathtaking cultural mosaic that defines our country, our world, our core stakeholders, and our contributors? All of us are building a bridge from a time of bewilderment into one of hope for the future. We are traveling a distance from what has often felt like darkness into light with the creative spirit of risk taking as our pilot lamp. We know that the darkness of night, that thing that frightens children and adults, is but one aspect of the natural world inextricably bound to the dawn. And we also know that night in and of itself has provided an endless source of inspiration for artists. We may be afraid of the dark, yet darkness provides an environment for the freedom and transgressions that offer fertile ground for endless innovation. Art invites us to traverse a nocturnal space, one which contains powerful seeds, a place which is ripe for the imagination, for dreams and for visions of the pathways ahead. We are learning that we need not be afraid of what we do not yet know. Artists exemplify this way of being. In an interview, Sonia Sanchez once said, 
quote, it is that love of language that has propelled me, that love of language that came from listening to my grandmother speak black English. It is that love of language that says simply to the ancestors who have done this before you, I am keeping the love of life alive, the love of language alive. I am keeping words that are spinning on my tongue and getting them transferred on paper. I'm keeping this great tradition of American poetry alive. Here at McDowell, we will continue to find ways to enliven our gates of accessibility as wide as can be to the most talented artists making work across the vast spectrum of our world. We are here to ensure a process that the ongoing body of work of established art makers, as well as potent new voices yet to be discovered, is always the beating heart of our mission. Thank you, Sonia, and thank you all for being here today. And now, with great pleasure, I introduce um, an extraordinary gentleman uh, extraordinary guest. I was fortunate to cross paths with Walter Mosley when he was an esteemed advisor to the Sundance Institute Film Labs. He is the author of 21 critically acclaimed books, and his work has been translated into more than 20 languages. His popular mysteries featuring Easy Rollins include Devil in a Blue Dress, Six Easy Pieces, and Little Scarlet. Two movies have been made from his work, including Devil in a Blue Dress and Always Outnumbered. Mr. Mosley has won numerous awards, including an O. Henry Award, a Sundance Institute Risk Taker Award, and a Lifetime Achievement Award by Penn USA. Mr. Mosley created a new publishing degree program aimed at young urban residents at the City College of New York, the only such program in the country. Walter served on the board of directors of the National Book Awards and on the boards of the Full Frame Documentary Film Festival, the Poetry Society of America, and Trans Africa. He is past president of the Mystery Writers of America. We welcome you, Walter, back to McDowell, where you were a fellow. Nice to see you there today. Um, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm, I always, like I, I pride myself on doing introductions of anybody uh, in, a, in a page. I can do it a page. I did it with Angela Davis. You know, I did it with Melvin Van Peebles. You know, I had a page <laughs> and I read it. I have uh, actually three pages for <laughs> Sonia Sanchez, but part of it won't be, uh, I won't have to say because that quote that, that was just read um, is in my thing here. <laughs> but that's okay. It's a great honor to be at McDowell and in New Hampshire, and especially here to honor Sonia Sanchez. She is an extraordinary person who gathers her humanity around her like the magnificent plumage of the golden-crested crane, pink flamingo, or sacred ibis, and all the other bright high flyers of Africa. She, Ms. Sanchez, encompasses the history and hope of black culture in America and Africa, in South America and the Caribbean, anywhere where the slave roots once flourished, and flourish still. She is our poet, playwright, songstress, storyteller, dancer, mother to her own children, and any other motherless spirit who passes near her complex orbit. She's an ordained stutterer, a titan, a revolutionary, and a dedicated daughter who has known sacrifice the way any warrior does, protecting her blood with her life. Anyone coming into contact with Sonia quickly learns that she has a commitment to truth and love and the rights we have fought so hard for. She stands up for herself, her people, and all people who live and breathe and love and lose. If death frightens her, she doesn't show it. If friends need her, she does not shirk. Ms. Sanchez is a wonderful poet. Her tanka and haiku work is both transcendent and ordinary. 
a state that every poet strives for. Her poem, This Is Not a Small Voice, sings to and reminds us that poetry is politics, poetry is people, poetry is psalms that are liberation songs that stubbornly survive to grow. Her poetry reflects a life that, like meditation, is a lifelong 24-hour-a-day profession of life. Here's an excerpt from one of her uh, poems about a child of the black arts and liberation movements. The day I heard the sound of your death, my brother, I walked outside in the park. We, your mothers, wanted to see you safely home. I remembered the poems in your mother's eyes as she, panther-laced, warred against the state. The day you became dust again, we, your mothers, held up your face green with laughter. And I saw you, a child again, outside your mother's womb, picking up the harsh handbook of black life. The day you passed into our ancestral rivers, we, your mothers, listened for your intoxicating voice. And I heard you sing of tunes bent back in a cold curse against black, against black, get back, against black, get back. She has won many awards, including this one today, the Jackson Poetry Prize, Penn Writing Award, American Book Award for Poetry, National Academy of Arts and Letters Award, the National Education Association Award. She has received the Peace and Freedom Award uh, from the Women International League of Peace and Freedom, the Pennsylvania Governor's Award for Excellence in the Humanities, the Langston Hughes Poetry Award, the Robert Frost Medal, the Robert Creeley Award, the Harper Lee Award, and the National Visionary Leadership Award, among many others. She was a leader among leaders in the black arts movement. She was and is a warrior against war. She is a child of risk and a mother to hope. In the uh, Dictionary uh, of Literary Biography, Kalamu Yasalam said, Sanchez is one of the few creative artists who have significantly influenced the course of black America, literature, and culture. Then I was gonna say what was said before, so I'm gonna skip that. <laughs> I do like to, you know, uh, when Etheridge Knight died, uh, we, we, a whole bunch of us got together to, to do, um, you know, readings of, of his poetry. And we were all asking, well, which poem should we read? And they said, oh, it doesn't matter. If you, if you read one of his poems and somebody else reads the same poem, it won't be the same poem, so don't worry about it. So I, I don't mind copying things, but <laughs> I, just, I have uh, two other things to, to say. Um, the, fir you know, the first is something Sonia never heard before. The second one I always say about her. Um, the first is something I never told Sonia before. It is that when I read her poetry, when I think of her journey, I am reminded of all things of Galway Canal. Not the man, not even the poet, not really, but just of his poem about poetry, The Bear. A poem for me that is about someone who hunts down something that lives and breathes and bleeds and dies. A poem about a fate that none of us can escape. It is that inescapable fate that Sonia Sanchez sings about and exalts. And there's just one other thing. You know, I, I always try to say this about Sonia because, you know, I mean, really, you can, you can like um, somebody's poetry and not like them. I mean, that's easy, right? <laughs> there's a lot of poets who are assholes. I mean, that's just a fact, <laughs> you know. And what you gonna do? But Sonia, one day, years and years ago, Sonia was leaving. She was going back to Philadelphia. She was taking care of her father. And I said, well, all right, um, I'll, I'll, you know, I'll take you to you know, Grand Central Station. So you know, we got in the subway, we went up to Grand Central. And you know, it, was, it was rush hour. There were thousands of people there. And you know, um, it's hard to see Sonia among thousands of people. You know, she's walking around, we're moving things. But this really tall guy, young black man in a uniform, all of a sudden just saw her and he, and he ran up and he said, Miss Sanchez? And she said, yes, my brother. 
And she reached out to him, you know. He said, I, I, listen, I, I just saw you. You know, I've been thinking about you. I've been dreaming about you. I've been, I've been praying about you. You know, my sister, my sister is pregnant. And he was trying to think of the next thing to say. <laughs> and Sonia said, does she want to have that baby? <laughs> and he said, yes, I think she does, Miss Sanchez. He said, and then she took out a piece of paper. This is my phone number. I'm going to be home by 11 o'clock tonight. You have her call me any time after that. Sonia Sanchez. We're going to give you the medal now, and then you can speak after that. So now we'll give you the medal. This is the 62nd Edward McDowell Medal that I am offering to Sonia Sanchez with enormous pride. Uh, thank you. Thank you. And you fondle it for a second. <laughs> To raise it up a little higher. Okay. Okay, if you don't mind. Do you know how to do that? Or no, do I you don't. Know more about this than I do. Okay. Can you raise this for us, please? Yes. I don't want to block the people that way. How's that? Okay. How's that? Okay. I had glasses. Oh, I got him on. How do you like that? <laughs> I need new glasses so you can see. This is what this is all about. I, I, oh, jeez. Um, hmm. I just want to thank all of you who have come out today. I, I want to... Most certainly, um, thank you. Uh, let me just oh. thank all of you for coming out. Um, you lovers of of writers and architects and composers and playwrights and just some great human beings people who have decided to write and build buildings, um, um, people who have decided to, to walk their justice words, their, their justice buildings, right? Their justice eyes are around the world. Um, it is always, an, I'm coming back, not in the winter, I'm coming, <laughs> <laughs> coming back just to be able to sit at a dining room table with some of the artists because you learn so much about your work. <coughs> Gotta hear that. Some of you who say, I only want to be around poets, you're an idiot if that's the case, <laughs> right? You know? You know, you want to be around those other people who have other visions, right? Who see poetry in a building and will give it to you, right? Uh, who will see poetry, you know, in a story, um, you know, and will give it to you. Will see poetry in a painting, right? Uh, that morning sun, that evening moon, whatever, and we'll give it to you. Um, I just want to thank McDowell Colony. You know, when this came to me, 
I'm, I'm, I, was, I used to know at some point when I got it, I told uh, our dear sister Nell where I was at the time, but I was completely shocked. It just reminded me so much of when I got the, um, uh, the award from the, the sisters. Um, um, Gish? Gish, when they called me and I hung up the phone, I thanked them, and right over my desk was this photo with Chinuin and myself. And Achebe had gotten that award many years ago, and he called me one day and said, Sonia, Sonia, will you come to this award and will you please say something nice about me? <laughs> <laughs> and I realized that Chinuin didn't understand the difference between American humor Right, and so I said over the phone, oh, I don't know if I can figure out anything nice to say about you, Chinua. <laughs> then I heard the silence. I said, oh my God, Sonia, you and your New York humor, you and this black humor. And I said, no, 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 Chinua, Chinua. No, 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 I was kidding. He said, oh. <laughs> I would never forget that, right. And I said, not only will I say something nice about you, but I'll even sing it up on that stage um, for you. And so when they said that to me, I stopped and I threw a kiss at the photo with the two of us. I said, my dear brother, he said to me later on as we were eating, one day you will get this award. And I said, now you know what I write, don't you? <laughs> and he didn't say he kept eating, right? And at the end, he said, no, 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 Sonia, you will get this award. And then I said, in the conversation, I said, oh, thank you, thank you very much, right? And when this happened, I saluted him and said, my dear brother, thank you for putting that out into the universe. And I want to thank my dad for putting this out into the universe. You know, that it is possible, is it not, for us all to listen to many different voices, you know? It is possible for us all, even though we don't always agree with everything, just to hear the beauty, you know, or the concern, you know, about this is my country too concern, you know, you know, my people struggled here for me to get an education at a place called Hunter College for free, whatever, whatever. You know, this is what this is all about, for us to be here together, to look at each other's faces, to say simply, like that little girl said when they were talking to her little black girl, she said, we is here. <laughs> I love that. We is here, and we is here together. You know, so you can drop all those little secret smells that you had. This is a country that we have decided to make what it should be finally, after all these years. <laughs> this is the country to stand up to those people I mean, you really read them, you realize that the only person they love is themselves, not the country, you know, not the people, not the history, not the history, but themselves. And it's time for us to look at each other and say, I don't want to marry you necessarily, you know, <laughs> you know, I don't even want to live next door to you necessarily, whatever. But I do want you there, you know when that trumpet is sounded that we've got to gather together and come together to save democracy in a place called America. So I want to thank you, McDowell Colony, Brother Andrew, Brother Philip, Sister Nell, Brother David, Brother Brett, thank you. And I remember when I called Brother Brett and said, you know, you know, like uh, his vertigo is kicking me, you know, whatever. And Brother Brett was wise. He said, uh-huh. <laughs> <laughs> well, then I said, but I'll be there. Make no mistake about it. If I got to walk it, I'll be there instead of driving it. And the artists and writers 
Jamal Adin, Brother Walter, I have a deep love affair with this brother, you know, that every now and then I call him and I say, hey, how you be? You know, talk, tell me what you're doing. Just tell me what you're doing, whatever. And then he begins to tell me what he's doing. And he said, I finished that book in 45 days and I cry. Not because of joy, I cry, but I said, oh my God, if I could learn that also too, you know? <laughs> you know, we could be there together. This is genius. This is my friend. Uh, this is my brother. Uh, this is the person who has listened when I have just cried when some dear friend has died. And I said, who am I going to talk to? I mean, you know, and I, I haven't brought it up with him. I said, who will I call like I used to call some of these poets at 4 o'clock in the morning? I said, you got to hear what I just wrote, right, you know? And she said, oh, God, Sonia, do you know it's for? I said, yeah, but you woke me up the other night at 3 o'clock in the morning. You know, get your cigarette. I know you're still smoking. <laughs> and just listen. I'm not asking you to tell me if this is good. I want, you to tell, I want you to hear where I was when I wrote this, where we all are when we wrote. And I remember reading that, you know, I'm still trying to find those people that I can call at 4 o'clock in the morning who will not curse me out, okay, <laughs> at all, because that is what I miss now, you know? Mm. And some of the friends, Sister Maxine Roach and her family, Sister Brenda Green, Malika, they had the most beautiful picture of you in the New York Times. I said, go on, girl. <laughs> Brother Sharif, Brother Kasahun, and the people who came from the school where they did that little booklet. Are they here? Is the sister here? Right. Over there, you know, when I finish, I want, you know, our dear student to read her haku because, you know, I was, you know, when I came in, you know, I was having this long conversation with Ms. Vertigo saying, you don't have to travel with me every place I go, you know, whatever. <laughs> I have a TV room in my house, you know, you can stay there and a, and a library that you can go in there and pretend to read, evidently. Um, uh, and just take over the entire house while I'm gone. But I do want to thank you, you for coming out, you for breathing and not stopping people from breathing, not holding people by the necks in America, right? Not holding people in the classroom saying, that's not real poetry, you can't write, you can't write about political things, right? It's not poetic, no, not those kinds of teachers, but those teachers who will say, right, you know, write, write of that future, write of that past, write, write of those people, you know, who came across that Atlantic, not the Caribbean, mm, mm, mm. but the Atlantic and their bones, the ones who jumped out for freedom are still at the bottom of that ocean. Write, so when I come in and say to you, how you doing, my dear brother, my dear sister, when I walked in some years ago to my classroom, and I, I taught for 45 years, people, and I came. <laughs> and to my classroom said, good morning, my brothers and sisters. My little brilliant student, you know, who's a really brilliant woman, you know, raised her hand and said, you do realize that there are other people in here too. I said, yes. I said, what are you saying? Well, you know, you said brothers and sisters, you know, and you understand there are other people in here besides us. I said, yeah, I do. I said, you know, you understand too, don't you? You know, that when I teach in here and what you're learning, that we're all brothers and sisters, right? Yeah, yeah, I understand that, but, you know, you said good morning, brothers and sisters, you know? I said, I sure did. I said, thank you, my sister. And let's thank all the brothers and sisters in this classroom who dared against advice from our English department about taking Sanchez's classes because she only teaches politics, you know. And I said, yeah, the politics of great writing. <laughs> yeah.
the politics of when I was at a place called San Francisco State, and we had all gone out, and I realized when they were cracking down on all the organizations, I remember saying to my dad, I need to go where you keep trying to send me into the classroom. I need to teach. You know, my, grand, my father was a teacher and a musician. I said, I need, because that will last. We would turn out troops. <laughs> you know, <laughs> troops of people, you know, with information, right, you know, and they'll go out and keep it going. Ain't that something? You know, I know I do. Ain't that something? You know, I even said, you know, real, ain't that deep? <laughs> oh, just listen to that. And that's what we have done. 45 years of having someone challenge me in a classroom, walked into the classroom because the department said, all you people who are full professors, you know, you need to share in the teaching of, you know, like the comp classes. And so there we were. Can you imagine after all those years being put back into a comp with 25 students, which been every weekend you were mocking some composition. I went, whoa, uh-huh. Right, is that so, right? So I walked into the classroom, a classroom of one woman in there and all white males. So I wrote my name on the board. Oh, shh. I turned around and said, you know what? If you don't want to stay in this class, you know, I'll let you go in, a, in one week. Stay for one week and see if you can listen to what I'm saying. You might want to stay, okay? Just whatever. Just let me know. I'll sign you out. I'll go with you and tell and bogart it with the other, you gotta take this person in, whatever. And I used humor in that classroom. You know, you know, I used humor to bring them with me. You gotta hear that. I said to you, I said to them, my brothers, I never forget when I said my brothers to them, <laughs> one sister sitting there, right? You know, one of the guys stood up and said, you know, I'm gonna go home and curse out my father. I said, no, we did that. <laughs> Nothing came from that at all. But go home and hug your father. Go home and teach your father. Go home and say to him, look, Dad, look how I am turning out in this world. Just look at me. I am much more human now. And when they did exceptional work, I used to take them to the teacher's lounge and give them free lunch, whatever. And the guy who cooked said, you know, I might have known I would have extra people today. I said, yeah, I have brilliant students in my class, that's why. But I had students who learned also how not to curse their parents the way we did because they found they thought their parents were backwards. They thought their parents were prejudiced. They thought their parents were this and that. I said, yeah, they might be but you're a teacher. You know, we are teaching you. You know, we are teaching you how to go out into the world. I'm not, you're not Jesus, so don't go that far, okay? You know, <laughs> But we are teaching you as students to go out. So what you learn in here, you go out and you spill out among the people with you, around you, and you'll go into these classrooms because I demanded that some of them become teachers. You, you want to be a lawyer? Ah, okay, be a lawyer, but dear, teach law. Teach the right law. <laughs> teach the law that they don't teach. Huh? <laughs> 45 years. And you know, I get those calls from my students. I saw you on television. I said, how'd I look? <laughs> <laughs> you look good, you look good, you know. I said, yeah, I was up all last night, you know, you know, um, trying to finish that bloody speech for all of y'all, right, you know. I said, it doesn't come as easily as it used to come. I said, I have a resident now in my head called Vert Vertigo, Ms. Vertigo, she's not nice, you know, whatever. I said, but thank you for calling me. He said, no, I screamed to my husband, that's my teacher, that Miss Sanchez. Listen to her, listen to her. Shut up, keep quiet, listen to her. And I listened to them. And as you go, and you walk in the streets of America, you know, you got to listen to them. 
We've got to listen to each other. We've got to listen to the children. We've got to teach these children. You know, we've got to teach our grandfathers, right? We've got to teach them that we don't have to be fearful at all, that this is our country, that we don't have to live underneath each other. You know, you know, I want my own little community, whatever, but I want you there when we got to march. I want you there when we got to write letters. I want you there when we got to vote. I want you there when we walk each day in the park and stop and talk to the trees and say, I'm not going to let them cut you down. We need you. We need you for breathing. We need you for your beauty. We need you. We need you so children will come and hug these trees. And when I finished walking uh, my three miles on the track, I would go with my trainer and hug the tree and talk to the tree and say, thank you for just putting up with these humans, <laughs> you know, with me, you know, because we don't know any better. We're not trees, but if we were trees, we would understand more about this land, about this earth, you know, you know, about our hearts that we continue to keep closed. Why do you want to close up your hearts? Who has told you something about me, about someone black, someone Latino, huh? Someone Chinese, huh? Someone Japanese, huh? Who has told you this? Stand up and say, where do you get that from? That's crap. <laughs> what I do know is that we are all humans on this earth that we are trying to make sure you remember that humanity, you know, that we walk upright as human beings and answer the most important question of what does it mean to be human? Mm, not pretty, mm -mm. not handsome, not a great basketball player, great baseball player, huh? No, what does it mean to be human? Huh? And unless we answer that question, there will not be another century. I guarantee you that. They will not be another century. That is a question that must be looked squarely in the face now, you know, period. And so I hope all of you, is it too late to read my speech? <laughs> <laughs> Just don't forget Jamal Abin wants to do a poem with you. I want you to know that this is what I said at Amherst for my, when they gave me an honorary degree. You know, this is it. And I said, well, I might as well share it with the audience. You know, whatever. But you know, that is what the spirit is about. The spirit in this room that made me go someplace else, away from a prepared speech. The spirit of my brothers and my sisters in here, you know. saying every morning you get up I write a morning haku you know you know instead of you know doing those little exercises in that bedroom I do a morning I have the little no, I sleep with little pads you know that's in my life I sleep with a pad and a pen right next to me you know I say yeah yeah um, you know and I lean over and I write a morning haku and by that's my meditation that makes me go out into the world and say, I will not hurt anyone. I will not kill anyone. Now, you see, for some of you young people, because sometimes I correct you, you think I'm trying to harm you. But I'm correcting what you're saying because it's not correct, whatever, <laughs> right, you know. You know, and people say, well, you know, why is she saying that to me, you know? And I get in the face, I am saying that to you because it's not correct. It's wrong information, right, you know? It's a different generation, you know. I remember when Queen Mother Moore, when Sister Margaret, when Sister Gwen, when Brother Sterling, when people actually corrected me on a stage, when I came off to the can, I said, you know, Sister Sonia really meant blah, blah, blah. I didn't go, ah, <laughs> whatever. I walked up and hugged and said, I thank you for giving me that information. I would not want to continue that, what I said, misinformation, because we have enough misinformation in the world today. 
You know, but you, my brothers and sisters, must begin to identify this misinformation. You can't lean back on your eyes and say, well, why do I have to say something about it? Because it's a world that needs to be saved. It's a planet that is on its way out right now unless we begin to gather up the eyes and the hands and the mouths of people with ideas about how do we save this bloody planet? Oh, those billionaires are tired of us? We'll put them in, a, in, in a one of the, we'll send them up to outer space to the moon. <laughs> whatever. Go there. Leave us. They can take all their little money up there and maybe start a bank up there, whatever. But yeah. At least not wars for at least 30 years, okay? Whatever. And let us, come on, the rest of us who have learned how to listen to each other, who have learned how to extend our eyes and our hearts to each other and our legs and our wounds to each other can say at some point, let us begin to take care of this planet. Let us begin to make sure people have proper housing. Let us begin to honor human beings again on this earth, period. Let us know that a dark color, a dark complexion, a fair complexion is not more superior than someone else. When some person says something that is incorrect, correct them gently. Don't curse them out. You know, as that brother in that class of all men and one woman said, he went home, he was going to curse his father out. I said, don't do that. We did that. We did that. And it did not work. What we did, we learned how to walk up to that person and hug that person and said, hey, why don't we have lunch together? Huh? I'm not a drinker. I said, but let us have, a, I'll have a half a glass of wine. What will happen is that I'll dance on the table afterwards. <laughs> but don't get upset about that at all, whatever. That's what I do when a little wine gets in my body. But at some point on this earth, get up in the morning if you don't write a morning haku, have a morning haku experience, say, I will not, I will not curse anyone today. I will not kill anyone today. I will not harm, I will not be envious of anyone today. Because if you stop being envious of people, you will see your own beauty. You will see your genius if you don't, if you don't stop talking about people. You can't talk about the genius of people and then expect to be a genius too. You'll never make it. Believe me, you'll never make it. But walk, walk in the beauty and the light that is woman, that is man. Walk in the beauty of our children. Walk in the beauty of this earth. Let's not lose this earth because it's destined to die about a, maybe a million years later, but we won't be here. But at least while we were here, we can say we supported it. We loved it. We loved the trees. We loved the flowers. You know, we loved even the sidewalks. You know, you know one day I was, one night I was coming home from some experience, and some guy didn't want to, I would live the ways from people, and he said, Miss Sanchez, is it all right if I drop you off here? And I said, yeah, you know? And I had to walk down some kind of dark streets, right? With my little briefcase, right? And my purse, and this young guy was coming towards me. And I stepped right in front of him, and he jumped. <laughs> <laughs> I said, my dear young brother, Thank you. You rescued me because I didn't know how I was going to get home two blocks from here by myself. Will you help me get home? And I grabbed his arm. <sighs> and we began to talk. I said, what do you do? He said, I don't have a job. I said, what do you do? What do you want to do? I don't know. I like walk, walk, working with flowers. I said, I teach at Temple. Maybe you can go and help plant the flowers. He said, you could get me a job. Hear that? I said, I can try. I can go down and intimidate them. I do that. <laughs> <laughs> they see me coming and say, what do you want now, Ms. Sanchez? You know? <laughs> Just the school. And he came and sat on the steps. And I said, let me go inside and get some information, blah, blah, blah. And this number I want you to call. And I remember... My son, Mungu, came out and said, someone's sitting on the steps. I said, yeah, that's a young brother I picked up coming home. <laughs> he said, you want me to stand in the doorway? I said, I think it's okay. I think he needs a job. 
But above all, he needs to talk to somebody. Above all, he needs to see, when he sees a female outside, he needs to protect her and not hurt her. Above all, above all, he needs to see another human being. And if we act in a human fashion, the next time he sees me, he will move in a human fashion too. You know that and I know that. And so I came out with the address and telephone number. I said, I'll call and tell him, what's your name? I wrote it down. I said, my dear brother, do you need a ride home? So many of her children need rides home. So many of our children are accused of doing things that at the age between 12 and 21 is not right up there yet. You know, they're not really adults yet. You got to realize that. So they make mistakes, whatever. And we must be here to correct those mistakes to keep them from happening. He got that job. I mean, it was a job working, planting flowers and stuff, and he enjoyed it so very much. But I'm talking about more than one person roaming the streets at night. I'm talking about each one of us who are in positions of power to help our children along the way. You know, and even the ones who come in in argumentative fashion, whatever, I leaned back and said, you know, motherfucker. <laughs> And they shake. It's a, uh, what did you say? I said, MF, get out of my face. Sit down. Shut up. Let's talk. Some real business. I wasn't being rude. You know, I was saying, you can't jive me like that. I grew up in Harlem, people. Whatever. You know, let's really get down to some business. And we don't have to use another curse word at all, right? But let us talk about what you really do want, what you really do need, what I need from you also, too. That's real. That's not make-believe stuff here, okay? That's real business. That is what we have to do at some point, to grab these children and say, we love you. We will not give you up. Give you up, you know, you know at all, you know, to this country to be misused and thrown away, right? You know, and kill. And I want to end with that. Look, I think I put something like that at the end. <laughs> so come, singing eyes, singing hands. Did you want this? Uh, I'll just do this. Right? Alarm in the death singers that we have come to celebrate life. Life, life, as we walk barefoot across our souls, always with a prayer on our tongues. The day is walking towards us, and I say, give us the spirit, my sisters and brothers, to put on our eyes, and forever let us be in the eyelash of your memory, where there is always the precision of young men and women saw themselves into the sleeves of change and love and activism and love, and it'll get better. It'll get better. eBay. Ebay, ye 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 how are you doing today, my sister? When the sister and brother rolls out on your tongue, you will really see that person looking at you. We're all brothers and sisters. I'm not being a romantic here. I'm being very logical about this one. We are not suckers. We are brothers and sisters. Let us walk upright as brothers and sisters and save this earth for our children and their children as long as this planet is going to last, period. I do love you, and thank you for coming. Thank you. Thank you. Shall I call Jamal Adina up to do it? Yeah. Okay. Thank you.
as a, a very special treat, um, one of our fellows, uh, Jamaladine Takuma, who has performed with Sonia Sanchez, is a musician, producer, performer, arranger, innovator, and bassist, is here. Um, Jamaladine has always stretched the mold of what and how a bassist is supposed to play. He has simply redefined his instrument's artistic potential, constantly touring the planet since the age of 18. Jamal Adin contributes to the music scene worldwide. His historical recording for The Love of Ornette, 2012, which featured his mentor Ornette Coleman, was released on his own music production label, Jam All Productions, which several with several recording projects featuring legendary members of the music community. Please welcome Sonia and Jamal Adin. Thank you. Just a plug in his base. Okay. I want you to realize that we artists are very organized. <laughs> And so when it was suggested, I said, oh, good, you know, we're going to rehearse. <laughs> so we're rehearsing right now. <laughs> oh. But this is a brilliant uh, brother uh, who plays brilliantly. And this morning when we were having breakfast, he said that he um, had got in a Max Roach piece when he was uh, drumming and he wanted to play it. And then I was going to kind of read underneath there, however, and he was going to, to play. Is that right? Am I right? Gotcha. <laughs> you know, you get to be what? What am I? What am I, Mariah? 80, you get to be 86, right? You know, you're not, you're not too sure every now and then, right? <laughs> oh. Nothing ends, every blade of grass remembering your sound. Your sounds exploding in the universe return to earth in prayer. As you drum, your hands kept reaching for God. The morning sky so lovely imitates your laughter. You came, you came, warrior clear, your music kissing our spines. Feet, 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 feet tapping, singing, impeach our blood. You came, drumming sweet life on sails of flesh, your fast feet rising. Riding, the air settles in our bones. Your drums, your drums, soloing our breaths until the beat, unbeat, until the beat, unbeat, until the beat, unbeat, until the beat, unbeat, until the beat, 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 be